Hey everyone, just going to start up screen share. So, uh, I hope everyone can see the slides. Uh, just a quick note before we start, uh, you can resize uh, the video and the screen share because the screen share should have taken over like most of the space right now. Um, so you can watch the presentation while asking questions in the Q&A box. Um, right. So my name is Christian. Um, I work mainly on the upstream kernel. I'm one of the maintainers of Lexi, Lexi, and uh, LexiFS, which is like sort of a whole um, container tool suite. Um, and we've been involved in in containers, in kernel development, and in user space for for quite a long time. Um, and we've been working on making unprivileged containers more usable. So basically, having unprivileged containers cover use cases that traditionally would only be uh, solvable by using privileged containers. Um, and I want to talk about a specific part of the work that we've done in this area, um, which stretched for which it's about like one to two years of work, I guess. Um, and it doesn't, it's just not, it's not just my work, but it in, involves a bunch of people. So it builds on stuff we first implemented upstream uh, in the kernel, uh, which takes a while, obviously. And then we also had to make the necessary user space changes. So that, that's why usually I'd say for a feature to actually land to be fully usable, it takes about one to two years. Um, and uh, this one specifically concerned with something that is called syscall interception. Um, and I've talked about briefly about this before, talked about in another session a little bit today I did with Stefan, but this is sort of a more um, in-depth uh, view. So um, here's the outline I thought might be useful. First, uh, we're going to quickly recap what unprivileged containers are because it's just always a good idea to be clear on what we're talking about. Um, and then I need to do a brief recap of syscalls, but not in any depth. It's like it's not, I'm not going to go into any architecture types, uh, differences and so on. Um, I'm just going to briefly, uh, briefly mention how this works. And then how SECOM ties into that picture and uh, what syscall interception is and how we can use SECOM for this and how we can do syscall emulation and uh, then hopefully we have some time for demos, but I'm prone to running over, so. But I, I promise to try my best. Um, so quick recap, I'm not going to go into, into a lot of detail because you, I guess most people by now know what, uh, what containers are. Um, what are containers? Uh, the famous dictum that a bunch of people are using user space fiction. Uh, it's a user space concept. Um, and your opinion on what a container are is actually very much opinion based. It's not something that you can clearly define as on Linux. We don't really have a native container concept, it's sort of more a kind of mishmash of various kernel interfaces. And it kind of de depends what kind of interfaces you think are necessary. I guess the one that most people associate with containers are obviously all the different types of namespaces that we have. Um, but I guess what most people could potentially agree upon is uh, agree on is that uh, containers have to do with some sort of uh, isolation mechanism, right? They provide you with some isolation from the rest of the system. Um, you can just create an arbitrary process and call it a container. Well, technically you could, but that wouldn't be much point. Um, and the, the biggest distinction here uh, for, uh, for system isolation from the rest of the system, not the biggest distinction, the most important aspect, I guess, is um, uh, the distinction between privileged containers and um, unprivileged containers, right? So what does this mean? 
Well, privileged containers, uh, it means if you root inside of the container, you're also root on the host in the sense that if you escape the container, um, you will have root privilege on the host. So UID zero inside of the container and UID zero outside of the container have the exact same meaning, which, which uh, as I said, is going to be a problem if you escape a container. And usually we have been strong advocates for a long time of if you can avoid using privileged containers for uh, for uh, for your workload, then avoid them be because they're in some sense they're a huge security liability. Um, and unprivileged containers, on the other hand, are containers where UID zero inside of the container and UID zero outside of the container are different. So you might it it seems to you like your UID zero in, inside of your container. So if you check your UID inside of the container, it tells you it's zero, but on the host, it's running as a uh, completely completely different uh, UID, a completely unprivileged um, UID. And uh, these containers are driven or enabled by a specific type of namespace in the kernel, which I've talked about quite a bit before, um, and also in the other talk today, uh, which is uh, the user namespace. This is what drives uh, what drives container uh, unprivileged containers. So, just a quick recap. Um, basically, the user namespace in general is concerned with isolating the privilege concept of uh, on a standard Linux system. Um, so that involves, first of all, obviously UIDs and GIDs, but it also involves, for example, um, capabilities. Um, specifically here about UIDs and GIDs. So I said, if you look at your process from, in, if you look at your container from the inside, you will have the impression that you're running as UID zero and GID zero. So any program will usually behave fine. But if you look at it from the outside, you see that the same process, if you inspect it, will appear to be run as UID 100,000 or UID 100,001. And how does this even work? Well, you can basically specify mapping. So you, you take a given range, you say, here I have a range of UIDs and GIDs that a container needs to have in order for it to run a whole Linux system. Um, and I'm going to carve out a, chunks of, a chunk of IDs uh, on, on the host, starting from, for example, ID 100,000. And then I say up to 100, uh, 200,000, this range is dedicated uh, to the container. And then I take the UIDs and GIDs that the container is running with. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I map them to 100,000 on the host. So zero maps to 100,000, one maps to 100,000 and one and so on. And it's a very flexible concept. Uh, you can have holes in your maps, meaning you can say that containers should only map uh, UID zero up to UID 50, then leave a hole from uh, UID 51 to UID 999, and then map everything up from 1000 up to whatever, 100,000 something. Um, so this is a pretty powerful security mechanism, especially when you also consider that um, capabilities that we have on Linux are also per user namespace. I've touched on this in the other talk briefly before as well. So meaning if you are asking the question, do I have a given capability in the user namespace? Uh, if, you, if, I have a give, if I have a capability, I'm actually asking, do I have that capability in the relevant user namespace? I'm not asking globally if I have that capability. Although I should mention this caveat, um, a bunch of capabilities or for operations that the kernel deems would affect the security of the whole system uh, it would always check, do you, do you have that capability in the initial user namespace? And if you do, then you can perform that operation. And if you don't, then uh, you cannot. So capabilities are sort of in this weird half namespace state. Let's put it like this. So they're charged against your user namespace or relevant user namespace. But sometimes the global user namespace um, is relevant. But since I mentioned this, user namespace spaces are a big uh, security mechanism, right? Um, they need to come with a lot of limitations. So as I said before, any operation that could potentially affect the security of the whole system 
um, needs to ask for permissions and or credentials uh, in the initial in the initial username space. Um, what are the limitations? Well, there are quite a lot of them. Um, and initially, I was like, hmm, I should do a talk about how we make containers, how we can make containers or make containers more useful, uh, unprivileged containers more useful, and then show all of the restrictions that we lifted over time or worked around over time. But that just would take too long. <laughs> so major restrictions are that we care about for this talk, essentially, is we can't mount block devices. So even if you, let's say you buy a hard, an external hard disk and you format it and you're like, if this disk goes to hell, I don't care. Um, and you hand it into the container, uh, the container still wouldn't be able to mount it um, because the files, the way file system parsing works, so file systems in Linux are not necessarily, not all file systems are able to guarantee that they're stable or behave well, safely, I should say, in the face of a malicious image. Um, so the file system parser could, for example, cause a kernel loops. Um, so mounting block devices is not something that uh, that is possible. Um, that's not to say some file systems can obviously be mounted in containers. Usually it's uninteresting file systems, right? So tempfs. Well, PROC is interesting, but PROC, SYS, and TEPFS, um, and a few others, BinderFS, um, but X4, for example, um, or XFS and so on, and NFS, they all, they're all not, you can't mount them inside, uh, inside of containers. Um, that might change at some point in the far, far away future, but uh, maybe not. Um, you also cannot create uh, device nodes. And this is, I think, an example I uh, bring up most of the time is um, you, if you can create random device nodes, right, you can take over the whole system. I mean, you could create def mem or def kmem and then just write bytes into random kernel memory. Or think about any other attack that you could do by just creating device nodes. Create a device node uh, for a new, what, you know, loop device or something. Um, so, in principle, and I mentioned this before, you can perform any operation that requires uh, privilege on the host. Um, but obviously, sometimes we know that a privilege that that an operation that requires privilege would be safe. So, the block device, for example, uh, block device example, for example. So, if uh, a user decides decides that uh, if the system administrator decides it's fine if a user wants to mount if I expose a device node to a container um, and it's fine if the user if the user mounts this I'm I'm fine with the user mounting this um, then there is not necessarily a reason why you should block this uh, or if something inside of the container creates harmless device nodes right. Such as Dev Zero or Dev Null or Dev Console. These are actually things we kind of work around anyway. A container a standard system needs Dev Zero, Dev Null, Dev Random, um, Dev TTY, Dev Console in order to function. And we provide those device nodes right now, usually for unprivileged containers, by bind mounting them in uh, from the host. But if somebody from inside the container were to call make not, um, for Dev Console, there's not really any reason why this shouldn't succeed. Um, when, for example, you start the init system and it tries to create a bunch of harmless device nodes, that should all be fine. Uh, so the question is, can, can we somewhat, well, I guess elegantly is a strong word, but can we somewhat uh, get around these restrictions? Um, and yes, we can, but we realized this a while back, this would involve potentially uh, a bunch of kernel changes. We actually would need a new sort of concept in a specific part of the kernel for this um, to work in a general manner, such that we, we can potentially enable 
even more operations than just caring about mounting block devices or mounting or creating device nodes. So this is where I need to briefly talk about syscalls because right, how do you mount something? Well, you call the mount syscall. How do you create a device node? Well, you call the make node or make node add syscall, actually. Um, syscalls, really quickly. Um, think of the kernel as essentially a request handler, I guess. And the syscalls are the main requests that recognizes. So, I mean, there are other ways to request something from the kernel, but what usually happens is user space wants an operation to perform that only the kernel can uh, can perform, and so it needs to make a request to the kernel, um, and then the kernel will look at this request and decide, okay, this is safe to do. You have you have sufficient privilege to do this operation, or it will say nah. So um, I promised I won't go into too much detail because obviously this call seemed like a very easy concept and then you remember that there are different architectures and that there are syscall conventions per architecture and then you look at libc code to look at how this is all abstracted away and then you look into the entry code of the kernel and then you go home and cry joking but um here's very briefly how this sort of looks like um you see this upper line the black line right here um both part is supposed to be user space and the part below is supposed to be kernel space. And I know I cannot do graphics. Um, so what usually happens is you have a process that process wants, wants for the kernel, wants the kernel to do something for it. So it does a system call. And then a transition, a magic transition into kernel space happens. Um, and that's what I refer to as syscall convention of that specific architecture. And then all architectures have all architectures have a so-called syscall table, which is really just a giant table or array um, that contains all of the requests or syscalls that this architecture actually understands. And uh, part of the syscall convention or of most syscall conventions, all syscall conventions, is that you place the syscall number in a specific register. So this syscall number is used as an index into the syscall table. And if uh, that request is understood, so if it's a valid syscall, then the kernel will perform the syscall. And if it, if it's invalid, then the kernel will return enosys, which is uh, kernel speak for, I don't know what you want from me. Um, and performing the syscall obviously involves like another syscall convention, how architectures return error codes and success codes and so on. It's really weird on some architectures. Spark is an example. Um, and then returning the value that you, some sort of value that you're interested in if the syscall returns a value, pointers, whatever. And that's the, that's the general uh, boring case, right? So, um, but actually, I mean, it happens a lot more, obviously, as I said before, but one of the things that happens um, in, in the syscall path is that at some point something is hitched, which is called seccomp, which I've mentioned before and uh, in previous talks too, and which some people uh, also um, will, know, uh, will know about, right? So you do a request to the kernel as well. Um, and actually before, the system call number is looked up in the syscall table, and that is the same for all architectures that support SECOMP. Um, SECOMP uh, is hit. So think about this, right? Before you even before you even answer the question whether or not this is a valid request that the kernel understands, you run through something that is called SECOMP, and that somehow has access to all of the details of that syscall, so syscall number and the syscall arguments and so on. And then SECOMP can apparently make some sort of decision. So it can, for example, say if you look at the screen path, um, so you can, it can decide, for example, to skip the syscall and then uh, return an error code or success or whatever. Or it can say, okay, continue, and then you enter the normal, the normal syscall path. But it interestingly sits at this 
uh, the position where it sits is uh, it's pretty interesting actually also for what we're uh, trying to achieve maybe i have par uh, have enough time uh, to touch on this briefly um so what's SecComp? uh SecComp is short for secure computing and it allows you uh, to restrict uh, syscalls that a task is allowed uh, to make so it allows for the implementation of um, deny and allow lists, right? So um, you can, for example, you can say a task is only allowed to make a certain subset of syscalls um, or the other way around, uh, only a certain set of syscalls is blocked. Um, and this is obviously interesting for cases where you need to, where, for example, your process doesn't uh, really need access to all of the syscalls that you have available. Um, it's obviously interesting for when you have a very privileged, when you have a, a process that needs to run with privilege, um, but you still need to restrict it. You can use it for that, but it's it's used in it's used in all container runtimes, um, and it has a first class security mechanism status in contrast to, for example, LSMs, which are part of the container world, but uh, it's it's they're not as widely widely used as secom simply because secom is not i don't even know if you can turn it off in the kernel's config option anymore but secom is basically available on nearly all architectures and it's uh, it has good user space support there's a library for it and so on so it's it's used everywhere from browsers to data centers as i've uh, written here and um the interesting, also you can write, you can write a bunch of uh, more complex second programs by using BPF. Uh, and this is actually not the, t the BPF that most people nowadays think about. When people hear BPF nowadays, it's eBPF, extended BPF. And uh, what I'm talking about is CBPF, classic BPF, which is a term that was coined after eBPF got introduced. So. CBPF used to be just BPF, but um, it's think of it as a dialect of EPPF or EBPF or a subset of EBPF. Um, it's not as expressive, and it doesn't allow you to do uh, as many many of the fancy things that EBPF allows you to do. And but you can write second filters in it, um, and the cool thing is that you can then specify you can filter on a specific arguments of a syscall. Um, uh, and values for those arguments that with a restriction, namely uh, that for SECOMP, uh, any pointer argument is opaque. That's a limitation um, of, of CBPF. Uh, so it doesn't allow you to dereference pointers. Um, so you can only filter on arguments that are passed in registered, completely in registers. Um, for example, you could filter on flags argument, usually integers or unsigned long or whatever. Um, so you could filter on the mount flags argument of the mount syscall or on the flags argument uh, in the open syscall. So you can say, for example, I don't want to intercept all mount syscalls. It doesn't make any sense. I'm not interested in, in remount syscalls be because if somebody has apparently already mounted it, why, why do I care about MS remount? And so you filter on... Uh, on uh, filter out all mount syscalls that um, have the MS remount flag passed. Um, usually what happens is uh, when you have a second filter that uh, it causes a syscall uh, to be skipped and an error code to be reported back to user space. So in the case of restricting the syscall interface of a given task, usually you would report back EPERM for an operation, EPERM or ENOSYS for an operation that you deem unsafe or unnecessary for this container um, to have. Um, so, but the thing is, you start up a, you start up a container, right? Um, it loads a second filter, and uh, that second filter is to some extent not uh, dynamic, right? You load that filter once, but and, and then the decision if a syscall with a given set of arguments uh, is, um, is hit, so the second filter triggers on a given syscall, then it will always trigger on that syscall. So you cannot make a dynamic decision um, 
uh, on a case by case decision whether or not you want to allow a given syscall or not. Um, so you cannot out outsource the decision to user space, but it would be kind of neat if we could. So if we sort of, you know, if we look at this part where SECOM uh, is hit before entering the syscall table, what about if we could you know, intercept the system call and then somehow involve another process um, that could then make the decision instead of making the decision inside of the kernel whether or not it's successful. This is obviously uh, interesting for the case where I said before, a container manager will often know policy of the administrator or because it's supervising the container and knows its privilege level and so on, whether or not A, a given operation will succeed and B, whether or not that operation is, is safe. More than the kernel. The kernel had, needs to have a policy for every user of that interface, right? And it can only say, oh, okay, this is, this is safe for everyone or this is unsafe uh, for some and therefore it is unsafe. It must be safe, unsafe for everyone. Um, and this is where we came up with uh, intercepting system calls. Well, I should probably say came up with it. I mean, ideas to do something like this have probably circled around for quite a bit. And also, it's not that SecComp itself is, is, is not something that other operating systems have never thought about. Some version of this in some form exists in other operating systems as well. There is a related concept, although a bit different in FreeBSD, for example, Pledge, um, where you restrict by classes of system calls, essentially you could emulate parts of this with, uh, with SecOM, but um, so yeah, but intercepting system calls. And this is kind of what SecOM already does if we go two slides back, and I hope there's not too much slack here. Uh, this is syscall interception in this diagram, right? The syscom is sort of intercepted by SecOM before it's, it actually proceed, proceeds in its normal path. Um, so what we wanted to do is outsource the decision about whether a syscall is allowed to a user space process, specifically in this example I'm using to a container manager. Um, and what better to use than file descriptors? Um, joking, but um, this is actually what, we, uh, what uh, was used to implement this feature. Um, so a task needs to load its own second filter. You cannot load a second filter for another task. So, um, but since we are the container manager and when we spawn containers, we are in control of the child process before it exits. So the child process in my example being the container, you fork, you set up, you synchronize between parent and child, you set up everything that you want to set up. And then at the end, you exec uh, your init binary. Um, at some point, it will load its second filter. So uh, since we're in control and we need to cooperate anyway when we start the container, the child process or future container can retrieve a file descriptor for its second filter, which is dubbed a second notify file descriptor, second notify FD. And that's a, that's a file descriptor for the second filter. Well, what does this mean? Well, I, as if you have encountered this uh, feature or if you think about it, it's pretty obvious. It's, it's a, it behaves like a standard file descriptor. So for example, it can be polled and you know the polling concept is usually familiar from when you get notified about uh, um, uh, another socket connection, and then uh, you call accept on it and so on. You get notified when file descriptor becomes readable or writable and so on. And this is, this is related. Uh, this time you, you get notified as well. So you can put it in an ePoll loop or into any notification uh, mechanism that uh, Linux provides. And then when the task of interest performs a syscall that the filter triggers on or the filter uh, registered, uh, registered for, you get a notification on the file descriptor. So you wake up. Um, and that indicates to the container manager in this example, oh, okay, someone uh, made a syscall uh, that I'm supposed to do something about or that I'm interested in. Uh, and uh, you can then use an IOCTL to read uh, sec secomp information from that secomp notify FD. Uh, 
that usually involves, uh, I'm glossing over details because it would take way too long. Um, it usually involves obviously the syscall number, um, the architecture, uh, and the syscall arguments. And then the process can go on and inspect uh, this, the container manager can go on and inspect the uh, syscall arguments. Um, and then make a decision based, uh, based on what the syscall arguments are. So uh, it can also chase pointers actually because uh, proc exposes the memory of, uh, of a process in proc pit mem. So you can also use the pointer based syscall arguments to take as an offset into proc pit mem, uh, into the process memory and then uh, chase the pointer arguments and so on. There is a race condition involved, but in this case, and I will briefly touch on this, it's actually not that bad. Um, and so the task can even read the memory of a syscall. And then when it has inspected the, the arguments and it's determined, okay, this, this, this is a harmless syscall. I don't really care if the container uh, performs it, uh, if a container wants to do this, but I know it would fail. Um, I could potentially do something about it. And then I can instruct the kernel to report back whether or not I succeeded. Uh, with this operation. And this is what this, uh, where emulating syscalls comes into play. So we have the pieces of uh, this interface now. So we register a second filter, uh, the task loads a second filter. That second filter has a give, has a specific property which, uh, which states, give me back a file descriptor for that filter. The container does it, the container hands off that file descriptor to a container manager. The container manager listens, listens for syscall events on that file descriptor. And then inspects uh, inspects the syscall arguments, and then, given a policy that a user decided is fine, um, it can start to emulate the syscall in user space. Now, it's usually not necessarily the most performant thing to do. It's also one must also make very sure uh, that to do this as securely as possible. Obviously. Um, but in general, it's better than nothing, right? Instead of having to fail a mount operation, for example, or having to fail a make not operation, we we can actually uh, we can actually emulate that operation in user space. Um, and there are a bunch of problems with this interface, which I'm briefly going to touch upon. I mentioned that Secomp doesn't like to chase pointers or the reference pointers, so Think about this. Uh, if you register, if you write a second filter and that second filter triggers on more system calls than you would want it to, and it catches system calls that would succeed, then it means it also needs to emulate them because there wasn't the mechanism to tell the second notifier to continue a syscall. So, uh, if you mount a tempfs inside of the container, that would succeed anyway, so why emulate it? But uh, given that you can't do reference pointers, it's pretty difficult uh, to special case tempfs mounts, for example. So I need to intercept these mounts as well and potentially emulate them, which is obviously terrible. Um, the same for open, which is also you can't filter on the path argument. Um, so any system call that is accidentally accepted needs to be emulated as well. Well, we've, we've gotten around these restrictions by making it possible to continue syscalls from the second notifier uh, right now, but that needs to come with a big caveat. You need, you need to be very careful. You cannot use this to implement a security mechanism because there's a race condition. If you perform a syscall, you inspect the syscall arguments, and in between you inspecting those syscall arguments and telling the kernel to proceed, an attacker could rewrite your syscall arguments and then you could be tricked into performing, the kernel could be performed, tricked into, you could be tricked uh, into letting the kernel perform a potentially unsafe operation. So what this means is no security policies can be implemented with the second notifier, especially not with continuing syscalls. And you need to be very sure that any operation that you're tricked into letting pass the kernel will already block anyway. Um, and that's actually the case for unprivileged containers, right? We, we're using this to elevate privileges where we think it's uh, it's safe. Uh, and if somebody, uh, so we inspect the arguments, 
uh, once. We verify that it's still the same task, and uh, then we make an informed decision on whether or not it actually wanted to. But we are fine with performing that operation. If somebody rewrites the syscall arguments after this, we don't care because we don't perform this syscall anyway. We emulate it, um, and if we inspect the syscall arguments and we're like, ah, yeah, I just continue this, let it pass to the kernel, and somebody rewrites syscall arguments, they will rewrite it to something dangerous, but the kernel will block all make not syscalls anyway, so no harm done. Um, and work that is currently ongoing is making it possible to retrieve file descriptors from a different task. There is a specific syscall targeted to this. This allows to bridge socket connections, so you could inter like retrieve a socket file descriptor, connect it for the container, um, uh, and so rewrite uh, socket connections and so on, and injecting file descriptors. So you can, for example, uh, when you call open, you can inject uh, the file descriptor for the open syscall. This is important for, for example, for Chrome, uh, which wants to replace its current way of doing sandboxing uh, with the second notifier. So there's a bunch of bunch of stuff here. And uh, I've, oops, I've sped up a little, so I could actually uh, still do the demo. I should have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to briefly stop the screen share and share a different screen. Whoop, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, let me make it, should be a little better. So uh, this is just, uh, this is Lexi running here. Uh, you might have heard about this. This is our uh, container manager we've, which uh, we've uh, written a long time ago nowadays. Um, and we're just going to launch a standard container. Should be fairly quick. And going into this container. And now let's say, nothing fancy in here. Let's not, let's say I wanted to create a device node. Let's look at the console. Dev console, as you can see right here, is 5.1. That's the major and minor number. So if I wanted to create dev console, I needed to do make not my console character device for C, 5, major, 1, minor. I hope that's the right order. And then, huh. Hmm. But actually, why why would it matter if we created this? Because we have dev console in dev anyway. You can see right here. So you could actually allow this. How do we allow this? Well, we use syscall interception. So we have actually config set for security syscalls dot intercept make not true. Then we need to restart because this is a change of the second filter and you cannot live update second filters. So, okay, let me see if I lied. Um, same exercise. Make not my console. Ah, that worked. Cool. This actually created a character device node for us. So, Let's look at this a little bit here. Not sure if I have time to show mount, but um, so uh, if I call the make notes call, you see, look in the upper half of this demo. Ah, handling make not syscall. That means the container manager, in this case, Lexi, uh, has been notified that the container has made a syscall with syscall number 133. Here's the architecture type. It's the second notify ID, which is like a unique token that makes sure that we are actually talking, that actually the task we received that syscall from is still alive. And then the syscall arguments, which in this case was the device number, the uh, PID of the process, uh, the task that performed the syscall, and the path that was used. Um, and obviously this doesn't unblock any, I, uh, obviously this won't work, but I mean, you can't create other device nodes, right? You can't suddenly my block, well, I don't know, 
B41, I mean, it all won't work. So you see, you get um, a device not allowed. So in a similar way, we intercept, uh, we intercept um, the mount syscall. I mean, I have a couple of minutes for questions and I will go answer them, but I think actually doing the mount interception stuff is kind of cool. So let's say mount true. And I'm also saying that I want to allow, oops, X, eh, ButterFS file systems. Now I'm adding a ButterFS device, Lexi config device, add a four, blah, uh, Unix, block source, stuff, loop, let's see. 10 path my block. It just added a device node to the container. We allowed it to do this man, uh, dynamically. And then def, oops, I, I called it my block, right? So um, right now, I shouldn't be able, I, right now, I shouldn't be able to uh, to mount this file system because I haven't restarted the container yet. So the second profile doesn't apply, but I just want to show that this doesn't uh, work right now. Um, permission denied. Great. Uh, that's how it should be. You shouldn't be able to mount random block devices. So let's see, restart at four. Uh, let's force it so it does it quicker. Oh, and then you can already see up here handling mount syscall. That's, by the way, all of the mount system calls that we accidentally intercepted whenever, um, because we can't filter on pointer arguments, but we just let them continue. So nothing changes uh, for the functionality of the container. But this is butter of five, five systems. So mount my block, I said, right? Let's see. Ah, well, that worked. So um, system call got intercepted. You see it right here. And uh, yeah, we we mounted uh, we mounted a ButterFS file system. Actually, I did something stupid because I mounted my own uh, I mounted Alexi's uh, ButterFS uh, backend. It stores all of the container into the container, but uh, just as an illustration. But yeah, so. Um, we do this for the mount syscall and for the make not syscall, and we do it for one specific instance of the ZX adder syscall. Um, but uh, this is a mechanism that would potentially allow you to do this uh, for a range of syscalls. Just need to make sure that you're erring on the side of safety. Um, and yeah, uh, I guess that's uh, it for me so far. And I am ready to take a bunch of questions. Um, so let's start with the oldest one. So I see right here, does this call interception feature require Lexi? Uh, does it work only with Lexi as a container manager? As far as I know, yes. We've implemented this in the kernel and in our user space tools. And uh, I don't know of anyone else who's currently using this. Chrome, as I said, wants to switch to this um, in the future. But for that, we need to have um, file descriptor injection uh, uh, available, which is something that um, Sagan is working on uh, working on right now. So there are patches for this upstream, maybe even already in Linux Next. I don't quite know right now, um, but yeah. And uh, do you have a GitHub to download the code for your work? Uh, well, uh, just go to the Lexi and Lexi repositories. Well, this is a bit of tricky, I should. So um, it requires cooperation between the container manager and the container, right? And so we uh, we have we have uh, implemented a protocol based on uh, based on Unix sockets, essentially that abstracts away uh, the intricacies of the 
kernel implementation and to keep this extensible. So I'm trying to say in a very complicated manner that you need to understand the source code in two repositories. So uh, you need to look at Lexi and, uh, and LexD. I'm not sure, I hope that helped. Okay, I think that's the only two questions I uh, see so far. I mean, but I can stick around. <laughs> oh, can you expand on the security aspects? Oh, oh uh, so many. Um, one thing, for example, I spoke about emulating emulating the syscall, right? Uh, Think about it to some extent, uh, glibc is in the same sort of spot, right? Sometimes, sometimes it emulates functionality that user space expects if the kernel doesn't provide it. And this is always kind of a risky business because you need to emulate all of the security restrictions that the kernel would take into account when performing that operation, right? So think about the make not syscall. Are you root? Uh, do you have the necessary capabilities in your user namespace? Uh, do you have a specific devices policy that prevents you from doing st from doing stuff and so on? Um, what is your current uh, C group state? What is your current UID and GID? What are your current capabilities? What is your current? What is the task seccomp status? What is the tasks LSM status and so on? So. Uh, for the most part, you can assume that, so if you want to emulate this one-on-one -on -one because you're performing a syscall for another task, that's potentially a long list of things that you need to take into account. Now, it isn't that bad be, be, because potentially when your administrator, so if if you can administer the Lexi daemon, we assume you, you need to have root privileges anyway. So if your administrator said, it's fine if if these syscalls are performed, um, that it's uh, then it's in in the general case uh, it's in general it's so it's okay um, if for example for the uh, we have a hard coded policy for make not that only allows the devices that we would be fine with bind mounting into the container at startup anyway so uh, we just that's fine. Other security aspects are, of course, if, as I said, with continuing syscalls, like for Lexi, this is fine. Be for unprivileged containers, this is fine because the kernel is, is your ultimate security boundary when it comes to syscalls. So the kernel anyway blocks anything that it deems is unsafe. If you continue a syscall and somebody writes bogus arguments in there, then the kernel will just look at the syscall and will go, so, no. Uh, so your, your, your the kernel is your ultimate safety net. Um, so rewriting syscall arguments is not really a big deal. But think about when when you guard for a privileged process, right? You implement a security policy for a privileged process, uh, and you uh, decide whether or not it's safe to perform a given operation. Now you have a problem because your current your the kernel isn't your safety net anymore. You're the you're the safety net. Your decision is just a safety net and you can be tricked. You can lose a race. You can lose a race, as I said before, where somebody rewrites the syscall arguments after you inspected them and made a decision and you let the syscall continue and the kernel is like, uh, fine, def kmem, I don't care, and then creates def kmem and then the process is like, okay, time to take over the system. Um, so. These are things to keep in mind. And anyone who wants to use the, especially the continue part, I've placed a long, long comment in how the notifier can be problematic in this respect in uh, the kernel header. And I stress this every time, 
This cannot be used to implement the security policy. You should probably make everyone chant this, but we're running out of time. Um, so yeah, um, the security implications of this uh, are uh, definitely interesting. Oh, so um, briefly, Chrome, I think I heard you mention Chrome wanting to use the second view such as well. I'm not very familiar with containers. Could you give a concrete example of what they're hoping to do with that? So a lot of browsers, well, a lot of browsers, I, I'm not a browser developer, I'm a kernel developer, so what do I know about browsers? But um, if they're restricting helper processes quite heavily, especially if they do encoding and decoding uh, and so on, um, and for example, when a task, as far as I remember this, when a task does a given open syscall, for example, and wants to give, uh, um, then uh, I think by default, uh, Chrome doesn't let them do the open themselves. Instead, they get notified about the open syscall uh, with a specific second feature that is called, uh, where you get a six, -sys, six -sys signal when a task performs a syscall. And um, then, uh, it performs the open syscall and does some weird trickery. Uh, does some weird trickery uh, to uh, um, to do the open for the task uh, essentially. Um, but this is a, a, th this becomes a problem now because glibc uh, glibc wants to block all signals uh, when it, if I remember correctly, when it starts new processes or when it creates new threats. And you can obviously see the problem here. So when you rely on retrieving a, a six, when you re uh, rely on receiving a specific signal, but then GLIPC uh, for security reasons, for its own reasons, uh, blocks uh, these signals, then you obviously won't receive them anymore, which means the sandboxing solution that you used before uh, won't work anymore. And so uh, this is why they want to switch to the notifier mechanism. It's also, in my, in my opinion, the way more obvious solution uh, uh, how to do this. This is actually, it, it put it in another way, this is actually what they wanted all along but never had or never knew that they wanted it. Or maybe they knew that they wanted it, but there wasn't a way to do this in, uh, uh, in the kernel. So they want to use it for sandboxing to answer the what they're hoping to do with that part. Okay. Good. I think this. If there are no more questions, then uh, thank you very much. And. and